Welcome to So Very Wrong About Games, a board game podcast where we lend you our opinion about board games. And armed with this information, we hope you can mold your own point of view of games using our past episodes and with our jaded assessments, how they contradict with you and your group's personal taste to form the basis of your next great board game purchase. I think you're encouraging independent thought with that kind of pitch, and that is something that I cannot condone in any way, shape, or form, because independent thought is often at odds with my thought. That's one of the reasons why I don't like to let you speak. I'm I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Okay. Why don't you introduce us? So my name's Michael Walker, and I'm here with my good friend, Mark Bigney. How are you today, Mark? Well, the pause seems to indicate that you don't know what my name is, which no, gives me pause. No, I was, I was hoping that you would chime in with your own name. Like, you know, sometimes there's that kind of banter, you know. I, I have to tell you what to and think then, and introduce and, myself? And, no. This no, is absurd. It's all good. So, on today's show, we're going to talk about games we played this week, news, and why it doesn't really matter. Then we're going to talk about our feature game, guess what, Reiner Knizia. Yes. Never heard of him. I know. Stevenson's Rocket. And... Our topic of the day, dealing with frustration. Mark, what did you play this week? This week, I got to introduce some people to Race for the Galaxy. I've been talking about this for a while, finally buckling down. It's been many years since I've had to teach Race for the Galaxy, and it is a bit of a slog. In point of fact, it's one of those games where the rules explanation can be almost as long as your first play which is a testament to how quick the game is rather than how complicated it is, although there's a fair number of uh, nuance. I have to say, though, just as as a preamble, I have never seen a group of people take to Race for the Galaxy as quickly as this table did. You had played a a few years ago maybe once, and the other player hadn't played at all, but even by the second or third round, people were like, yeah, so this is a military windfall world, right? So I don't have to pay for it and it starts with a good, which is amazing because I spent years explaining Race for the Galaxy over and over and over again. It is not something I enjoy doing, but it is a game that I absolutely love playing, and it has not been in regular rotation around here. I don't know if it ever was. When it was released, I I didn't live in the city, so I can't speak to what it was doing then. And Tableau Builders are all the rage. In fact, we'll probably be talking about another Tableau Builder in terms of games that we've played this week. And I I still maintain that Race for the Galaxy does Tableau Building far, far better than anything else. You, You yourself mentioned, again, you know, right around round two or three of the game, it's like, wait, so in order to put out this card, I need to forego putting out all these other cards? I'm like, yes, choices. It's really, really good at giving you those tough trade-offs. We played the Xeno Invasion version, which is the third arc of expansions. Uh, I could go into detail, but that would take the entire podcast. I'm not a huge fan of the new mechanics that it introduces. I still maintain that the my favorite way to play is the base version with the first three expansions, namely all the way to Brink of War. Uh, with prestige without takeovers, you know, the the whole spiel. But any version of Race for the Galaxy, I think, is worth playing. A lot of people prefer Roll for the Galaxy. I'm not one of these people. I think Race for the Galaxy is uh, gives you a lot more options in terms of what kind of throughput you want to emphasize, in terms of what kind of trade-offs you're going to do. Every time I play Roll for the Galaxy, it feels more samey for me, whereas for Race for the Galaxy, I feel like a, a broader range of available options. Anyhow, I'm going to try to parlay the success introduce in... Uh, in terms of introducing race into showing it to more people, hopefully get it back into general rotation. And that was Race for the Galaxy, specifically the Xeno Invasion. What did you think, Walker? I think it was great. And I think I think it just has a reputation of being complicated because it came out, I think when you said I played it a few years ago, you were being very generous. It was quite a few years ago. <laughs> and I, for its time, I think it was very complicated. But in today's day and age, like I just, because like, now that I've played one or two more games since then, it was it was like, this is, this is, you know, very easy. The cards are very laid out. It has it goes through every phase, and every card has a little highlight on if that card triggers during that phase or not. So it's very easy to follow. Not really that much difficult. Like like you said, it has a reputation of all these crazy symbols, but in today's gaming, it's really not that big a deal. If you compare it though to a lot of its competitors, even say Terraforming Mars, I think that the iconography of Race for the Galaxy is a little bit more daunting than understanding how a Terraforming Mars card works, for example, or some other tableau builders that we really like, Ginkopolis or 51st State. Both of those involve internalizing a set of iconography and Race for the Galaxy, although I think the payoff is absolutely worth it 100%, and they're much deeper, richer games, all the Race for the Galaxy games, than any of those other tableau builders. It is a little bit daunting in terms of internalizing what the icons are. And actually, you, uh, to, to give credit where credit is due, you you pointed out um, not an inconsistency in iconography, but an element of not perfect synergy, let's call it, 
with respect to what a drawing drawing a card icon looks like that hadn't occurred to me that you know there's a similarity it, the same icon is used for keep a card during the explore phase as is used in draw a card and all these other all those other phases and you found that a little bit confusing and when you pointed it out to me i you're like you're right that is that is strangely uh, uh asymmetric in terms of how it's presented which is not to say that it's presented badly it's just there's a fair amount to wrap your head around but anyway i'm i'm very glad you did not find it daunting and i hope that i am able to introduce it to other people who find it accessible as well. All right, Race for the Galaxy. I picked up a copy of Everdale by Sterling Games, and it's a, a nice little pretty tableau worker placement game. We just talked last week about gateway games. I think this would be a fantastic introduction to worker placement, you know, for a family setting or whatever. It's a fantastic art. Uh, it has problems as well. Uh, like I said, when it, we'll talk about frustration things later, but just uh, things that just a simple playthrough would have got through. Some of the cards, the wording wasn't very clear, and this giant tree in the middle, I just can't see how it wouldn't be you know, seen as in the way. I can think of something very easily different and more aesthetically pleasing and useful, but that is... Everdale and Mark, you played it. What do you think? Well, I agree with you entirely about the tree. We played it with three players. You played it a number of times. I only, I don't, I've only played it the once. And honestly, it was only in the precise table configuration that we had that Everdale was even playable, which is a strange thing to say. If we'd been in a circular table, if we had been unable to sit anyone at the end, I don't know how we could have played with three players. Literally, I, I do not know how we could have situated the board such that three players could have been able to access the game. Yeah. Don't even get me started on four. And if you're playing two players, you have to sit side by side or around a corner from each other. The tree is lovely. It's a lovely it's game. A lovely the, art, tree. the art is gorgeous. The new Vogue, I, I don't know if this, this is probably just purely coincidental, but the new Vogue is sort of a, a return to kind of the Mice and Mystics aesthetic of a cute little woodland creatures that are kitted out in a sort of vaguely fantasy environment. Uh, you know, think Root, think Mice and Mystics, think all the, think uh, Mouse Guard, stuff like that. And the art is very, very well executed. All the, all the, the cards are so charming to look at. But, you know, it, at the end of the day, in terms of decisions, I didn't really feel that they, there was a tremendous quality of decision making there. The only novel bit there, because worker placement and tableau building has been done to death, was this whole notion of if you build a building, you can then play out a creature for free. Well, there are two problems with that primarily. One of them is you never know if that card is going to come up. You can either be having the critter that you want to put out for free and desperately looking for the building. Maybe someone draws it randomly and you'll never see it. Maybe it comes up in the tableau and someone snatches it before you do because of arbitrary turn order considerations. Or vice versa. And it's honestly really obnoxious. It undercuts one of the things that could have been a clever selling point. It reminds me very much of the way it was done in Attica, which was which is a, a relatively older Marcel André Casasola Merkel tile laying game where you're trying to put out all your city tiles. It was clever in that your tiles came out in a random order, but everybody had the same set of tiles, and you could build a building for free if you placed it next to its prerequisite. So you had a geographical constraint about trying to make sure that you could lay out the subsequent buildings in the proper way on the board. And furthermore, you knew that the buildings would come out sooner or later. You just didn't know the order. So there was a little bit of a risk-reward there. And there was no chance whatsoever that someone would snake it blind. Anyway, so it reminded me a bit of Attica in that sense. Uh, but yeah, it's reasonably accessible. I don't know how good it would be as a super intro game, uh, precisely because, as you say, some of the wording of the cards is a little bit off. Some of the timing considerations are, are perhaps a little tricky for, for new players. But, you know, it was absolutely lovely. I have no desire to play again, but I didn't object to the time I spent with it. No, exactly. The, the components are great. Just to, you know, to go back against some of your statements, there is a large tableau that everyone can play f from. Right, which might help you get the cards you're looking for, and cycling your hand. If the turn order, if the turn shakes order out right. shakes out right, but they're not they they're not necessarily going for the same cards you are, unless you know they're both cards are there, and the fact that you can cycle your hand fairly easily, you can get new cards and cycle out other ones. There's some just arbitrary numbers like your hand size is you know eight cards eight yeah. for whatever reason, and your I guess it was through play testing and air quotes that you know your tableau can only be 15 cards large. But, you know, all these arbitrary numbers aside, I would, I'm would i going to play it a few more times, going to wait for the expansion and try that out. And that is Everdell by Starling Games. Blast from the past, we played Starfarers of Catan. Catan has a bit of a bad rap in many circles. Uh, many of those circles are occupied by Walker. Core Catan I do not enjoy, but a lot of the Catan variants 
I find very interesting. I like some of the historical Catan versions. I really like the older two-player Catan card game. And I also like Starship Catan, which is not Starfarers of Catan. I haven't tried the newer two-player card game version of Catan. But Starfarers of Catan came out in 99, and it has these ridiculously awesome plastic motherships that you literally graft on upgrades to. You add on little cannons, you add on boosters, you add on all these other things. Whether or not any of these components or all of these components resemble, let's say, adult massage elements is, you know, up to individual judgment. Uh, But they also have this weird colored ball system that serves as the dice of the game in a a very real sense. Anyhow, it's a lot of Catan to have. You know, you're you're talking a solid two hours of Catan, and I realize that's a lot. It's not something I want to play every day. But I really do like Starfarers. I, I find it thoroughly enjoyable. The core engine of using uh, of the, the menu of resources requiring to build specific things and having to supplement whatever in, income problems you have with trading is a very, very solid and enjoyable element. And that's the one, the only thing I think that really uh, brings Catan all together. But I think that the spatial element in Starfarers, no pun intended, is handled better than in Core Catan. You don't have the the, uh, the issues that you have in Core Catan of the game stagnating in the same way due to a variety of implementations. You also don't have the problem of being thoroughly cut off. It's possible after setup to have realized that you've lost the game in Core Catan. Anyway, I could go on and on about the specific differences, but suffice to say that Starfarers is very, is long out of print and is very, very fragile but awesome components. I'm very glad to have tracked down a copy that's intact, and it's definitely something that I want to pull out every few months or so when I want my Catan fix. Uh, but when it comes to Catan, you really only need a, you know, a couple of your favorites. But And since sci-fi is usually my theme of choice uh, i'm very i'm very pleased to play starfires of Catan. i definitely want to try out the game of thrones one as for starfares i think it's great i think it'll uh, benefit from repeat plays because i think there's strategies there with all the different uh, space stations you go to they all give you st- uh, special abilities so once you get to know the decks then you can try all these like cool different combinations and i really like the fact that you, everyone has a basic starting thing so there's not like you said there's not this like crazy awkward you know, unbalancing start out. Everyone starts the same, and then from there, you know, it's who, anything goes. Glad you enjoyed it. I got to play a game that it was a Kickstarter. It's called Barbarians The Invasion by Tabula Games. Yet another worker placement, but this one has a really cool volcano. And how can you go wrong with volcanoes? You cannot. Uh, has like this. I pop- can think of several ways you can go wrong with volcanoes. <laughs> I know, it's so awesome. Anyway. For this volcano, you start off at the top. You went to Italy, didn't you? I know. I know. I think there's a lot of evidence about how volcanoes can go wrong in Italy. <laughs> Not that you need to go to Italy. To, it's no, pretty intuitive. It is. It is. But in this particular volcano, <laughs> it's all sectioned out in this uh, this uh, catacomb. Uh, sorry, honeycomb or pie shaped thing where you start at the top, and that'll give you two more options. And you start your first worker on the top, then the second level and third level, and you work your way down. And you can only go to spaces that you know are connected. And it's it's a really cool system. Has little hints of Champions of Midgard because it's yet another Vikings go out fight monsters, uh, worker placement type game. But they do quite a bit of uh, other things that are different. Although in Champions of Midgard, when you do all the combat, the game stops and everyone does a combat. And usually, always everyone is involved in some way in the combat. And it's dice rolling, right? Almost, I can't think of anyone that doesn't enjoy dice rolling you'll get hits and it's fairly quick you go through it everyone's done in this game unfortunately uh uh, it goes around turn order and everything stops when someone does combat it doesn't really take that long but it is it does interrupt the flow yeah the pacing grinds to a halt when anyone's doing combat they need to cross-reference the enemy type with the terrain type and then figure out what they need to buy, and then they go through this push-your-luck thing, which is a shame because the combat element, this issue of, of conquering the effete, weak peoples that are not barbarians who don't live in volcanoes, is the best part of the game. It's the most interesting part. It's where all the different sort of upgrades you can get for your barbarians come together, and there's there's this interesting element of where the resource manipulation collides with a risk management system and how many hits you're willing to take and you want to go for extra points and there's a whole bunch of neat stuff in barbarians the invasion and the worker placement's neat uh but honestly it it, it's it's got a number of problems among them as as we say the flow grinding to a halt 
and which really makes the game feel longer than it is. You know, it's about 90 to 120 minutes, but when a lot of that is just sitting around waiting for someone to resolve a combat, it really does make it feel longer than it is. And I feel like the spatial element of the volcano is used well, but it could have been exploited a little bit more. Because, again, if you're going to be making a worker placement game, you really have to play to your strengths in order to differentiate yourself from the millions of other worker placement games. We really didn't talk about the coolest part of the volcano, and that is... Every turn, it actually turns and changes how all the, the spaces line up. And you also get god cards that will allow you to turn it yourself and potentially mess up other people's turns as well. Yes, but I feel, and this is, this is just an element of a lot of worker placement games, that the messing up with other people would just be an afterthought or an accident. Because there's not a whole lot of player interaction. It's the standard issue of just get there first, of getting the resources first. You don't even necessarily internalize what other people are looking for, per se. Uh, and, you know, look, in moderation, I've got no problem with, with get there first worker placement. We've talked about Feast for Odin, and if Feast for Odin doesn't have better player interaction than Barbarians the Invasion does. But here's the biggest reason why I'm not going to be playing Barbarians the Invasion anymore. So, shelf space is limited. Game time is limited, budgets, budgets are limited, and I'm always looking for good ways to be able to write off vast swaths of potential purchases that might be a time or money sink, all right? One of them is we have too many good two-player games, and we don't play a lot of two-player games. Some people have said that this is a cultural issue. No, it's just a local meta issue and just our local social group more than anything else, because in other cities I played lots more two-player games. So any, you know, big, splashy, multi-hundred dollar two-player primary game, I can safely say pass. And if it's truly brilliant, I can track it down later. This is one of the reasons why I'm able to easily pass on something that's on Kickstarter now, the Edge Dawnfall. You know, early res- early reviews are mixed, and I don't really like the previous work of, of the designers, even though I really like the minis. It's primarily a two-player game, so so long. But getting back to Barbarians: The Invasion, I am I've I've made a decision actually. I am done making apologies for the art in my games. I am done looking at a card in a game and saying, "Wow, this is off awfully juvenile and boob heavy." I don't have to do that. There are enough good games that I can just say about those games, not for me. And the reason why I tracked down Barbarians the Invasion was because it was done by the designers of Hyperborea, which is one of my favorite euros of the sort of combining resource management with quasi for x ish stuff of the past few years. So we really like Hyperborea. Uh, but in addition to the fact that it's a relatively generic worker placement game most of the time, a lot of the art, I think, is downright regrettable. It's just, you know, standard, uh, you know, th- this, this character is a warlord, but she's wearing a silk nighty in no underwear, you know, stuff like that. And... I actually had a conversation, uh, a a very brief exchange with this with uh, Artem Nichipurov, the designer of Guards of Atlantis, where he was standing up for uh, artists' freedom of expression. And my response to him was was simply, I don't think that games like this shouldn't be published. I'm just saying that they shouldn't be purchased by me. And so I'm done with games like that. I'm done with games that I think would be, uh, you know, that, that have embarrassing depictions of women. I don't care if it's thematically appropriate. This is the reason why I passed on Conan so easily, by the way. One of the reasons. Again... I don't need many excuses to be able to say no to, to, to more games. And I think an excellent excuse and one that I'm going to be trying to carry forward is if I think the, the art is embarrassing or reductive or, or cheesecakey or whatever, I'm just not going to bother with it. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why uh, Barbarians the Invasion probably not going to see any more play for me. Well, that's too bad. I didn't mind it at all. You can have it. I don't should say I didn't mind it at all. I, I, not the artwork. I didn't sure. mind the game. Yeah, yeah. I you, do, you can have it. I don't want to take – no, no, no. No, we'll we'll throw it up for trade as per usual. I do want to just touch on two quick things I forgot to talk about in the combat, not to take away from your statements, but uh, they had that overkill thing, which I think Champions Midgard, which they had, that's it was fantastic. If you do more extra hits, then you got an extra Benny, and the fact that uh, you got some trickling in resources from the combat as well per the cards, I thought that was a great uh, addition as well. And that is Barbarians the Invasion by Tabula Games. We also get to try Forbidden Sky. Forbidden Sky is the latest in the line of co-op games by Matt Leacock. Matt Leacock is the guy who uh, developed Pandemic and so arguably invented the sort of modern template for co-op games. And I really enjoyed Forbidden Sky because, unlike some of the other lighter twists on Pandemic, it gives control back to the players. Let me explain. Pandemic, although it's a game that I truly, truly enjoy and I don't play enough of, At its heart, what you are doing is killing time waiting for the game system to give you the cards you need to win. And that's not really a criticism. It's just a statement of how the victory conditions operate. And the other 
Forbidden Games and the Game Right line, Forbidden Desert and Forbidden Island, didn't give you enough to do while you were killing time and didn't have enough mechanical interest to engage me so that it was really, really transparent that all I was doing was just killing time, waiting for the cards to come in, into me. Forbidden Sky, in addition to the fact that it has magnets and uh, electronics and you get to build a circuit, which is just amazing and awesome and cool, it's tile placement. And it's an action to pull a tile. It's an action to place a tile. So you're not waiting for the end of your turn to pull two cards, hoping you get the green you need to cure the disease or what have you. Instead, it's a question of spending the actions necessary to be able to have a pool of tiles, knowing when to put them out, etc., etc. And that minor shift, I really, really like. It makes me feel like I have so much more agency over the game. And so above and beyond the fact that it's uh, a much simpler game, it nonetheless feels a lot more gamey in a lot of ways and a lot more satisfying and meaty precisely because I've got this feeling of control. That and it's – the components are ridiculously awesome. So I really enjoyed Forbidden Sky. It's not the deepest thing in the world. I'm not going to say it's as good as Pandemic. But of the sort of Pandemic also rands that Game Right has been put out, I think it's, it stands head and shoulders above the rest. And I'm definitely looking forward to giving Forbidden Sky a few more tries. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I wish it was a little bit harder. But other than that – Ah, we'll try harder difficulty levels next time. There we go. Like many of those games, it's the difficulty seems to scale with the number of players, but it scales in the opposite direction of Pandemic. Pandemic, I find, more difficult with more players. Forbidden Sky, early experience suggests, is easier with more players. Uh, again, partially because you're not trying to centralize cards. The tiles can be spread out, and that's fine, and that's actually to your benefit, so you can spread out and cover more ground. It comes with four difficulty levels, and we were on difficulty level two of four the time we played, so we can definitely ramp it up. Sweet. And that is Forbidden Sky. And those are the games that we played this week. On to the news and why it doesn't matter. So the sale of Asmodee has been finalized. We've been talking about this in passing when it was first announced, when it was speculated who was going to buy to who. So apparently it's a done deal. Asmodee has been sold by Eurasio de Pi Partners. And that isn't so much notable, but... You know, it's one of those trickling effects. We've been commenting when Asmodee has been ma- making major acquisitions, but just seeing the press release from Asmodee and Pi Partners, just a sort of summary of what's going on, it, it really is staggering. So over the past four years, they claim 37% annual growth by acquisitions mostly, w- whether it's actual sales growth or, or acquisition growth. I mean, I don't know about the breakdown, but that's, that's impressive. And they claim to account for roughly two-thirds of the hobby game sales in the world. That's a lot. <laughs> that is a high proportion. Uh, parenthetically, they have also recently acquired ADC Blackfire Entertainment, which is a kind of a toy and hobby distributor primarily. Uh, but, you know, what? What? it's a day ending in why Asmodee has bought something else. But, uh, yeah, as I say, just seeing the summary laid out in core numbers, it was just really gobsmacking. And so Asmodee has been sold. So do they own uh, Wizards of the Coast? No, they don't. Uh, I just looked it up. Hasbro owns Wizards of the Coast. but And again, this could just be pure marketing spin, right? What they constitute hobby game sales might exclude things like CTGs and exclude things like Monopoly. But, you know, the fact that they sell all versions of Catan now, for example, and the fact that they sell all versions of Pandemic and all these other things, and they distribute most, even even some of the core stuff that sells a lot of copies in North America, they distribute the international versions nine times out of ten. So I could easily believe that they actually constitute roughly two-thirds of the hobby market. But then again, you're right. Maybe it's smoke and mirrors. All their Star Wars stuff is, is and, you know, all the fantasy Star Wars stuff, and that makes big, big money. That's but true. I, I just can't see them going against the magic dollar. That's all. It's a, it's a different market, but then again, they will be dipping their toes in that with uh, Keyforge. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. So my bit of news is actually interesting to me for a change, believe it or not. So there's a game called War Room by uh, Larry Harris. He's the designer of Axe and Allies. It was a Kickstarter that should be shipping relatively soon. Uh, he's done it with Nightingale Games. So the problem arises when uh, because the games get Produced, not produced, uh, manufactured. manufactured in China. And back in 1928, uh, China adopted a flag. And then it was changed uh, during the Communist Revolution in 1949. But Taiwan did not change the flag. And it's a little, you know, it's a, uh, an issue of contention. So when a World War II game comes out and you want to put China's original flag on the box, because that's the flag that China flew during World War II, it becomes a problem when you try to ship it out of China. So they've decided that instead of, uh, you know, of it getting held up in customs and getting their manufacturer in trouble, that they're going to remove 
uh, the Taiwanese old China flag off the box and uh, maybe issue stickers or something. We'll see what happens then. I just thought that was very odd and uh, interesting. If we're going to talk about history, I would just like to uh, point out that a few days ago was Arkhipov Day on the 27th of October in commemoration of the day in 1962 when a man named Vasil Arkhipov saved the, every human life on the planet. If you're not familiar with it, then uh, by all means, look him up. All right. My last bit of news is Simon is finally getting a zombie franchise. It's uh, They've acquired the license for Night of the Living Dead so they can finally make a zombie game. I've often, I've often been thinking that what Cool Mini or Not really needs to do is try making a zombie game. It's really striking that they haven't done that yet. It, it has this weird thing in the bottom where it says it's a zombicide game. I don't know what the zombicide thing is. Maybe it's like a smaller... A smaller imprint smaller that they're trying company out? company or something. Yeah, Maybe yeah, that's you yeah. Know, doing the rule system for them or something. Sure. But, Night of the Living Dead, acquired by Simon, another zombie game. You know what? They should really have an expansion with bees. Bees, yeah, yes. what, what would they call it, though? Zomba bees. Excellent idea. From space! <laughs> <laughs> uh, finally, a plug for the Kickstarter for the expansion to Spirit Island, which is called Jagged Earth. It launched very shortly after our recording of last week's episode, so we didn't get to mention it. Uh, they don't need your money. They've got plenty of it. But if you wanted to give them money, I'm sure they would happily accept it. There's going to be tons of new content in this expansion. I was actually quite surprised. I was confidently saying, oh, look, I, I know the way Eric Royce works. You know, he'll, he'll, he'll play test X spirits, but he'll only have a third of that in the final box. Not so much. There's going to be ten spirits in this sucker, and that's even before you start getting in stretch goals and promos. That's a lot of new stuff in the Jagged Earth expansion. Now, it looks like Greater Than Games have learned their lesson after the tremendously overdue Kickstarters that they've run the past couple times, namely the Oblivion one, which was held up in Chinese New Year for five years running, or the Kickstarter for Spirit Island itself, which was delayed by 23 years, I think. Uh, This one is projected to be released in the summer of 2020, so they are definitely hedging their bets, and I respect that, you know, (laughs) better to under-promise and over-deliver. But the Jagged Earth Kickstarter is live now, and um, full disclosure, as always, I'm a personal friend of Eric Royce, the designer, but I'll definitely be picking it up, and if you love Spirit Island like I do, and like most of the rest of the world does except for Walker, then I highly recommend it. I'm just saying, you said there's a lot of stuff in the expansion, maybe there's enough in there that will actually make it fun for a change, that'd be great. Look... So Here, that's the news. I just like to point something out. Every time I, not even when I rag on a certain terraforming game, every time I mention it, five angry people crawl out of the woodwork and tell me that I need to shut my big fat mouth. But you get to rag on Spirit Island all the time and no one says anything. I think this that, is desperately unfair. That's because no one listens to me, Mark. <laughs> so that's the news and why it doesn't matter. On to our feature game, which is Stevenson's Rocket. Which is a fantastic sci-fi space game. <laughs> <laughs> the Stevenson's Rocket was one of the first commercially produced steam engines, and so this is a game about 19th century Industrial Revolution England. Stevenson's Rocket was first published in 1999 by Pegasus Spiel, and it was uh, reprinted by Rio Grande Games back when Rio Grande Games was more of a thing. And it was reprinted this year by Grail Games, and it's it's now just now hitting Kickstarter backers. To be frank, I was very surprised when I saw that Stevenson's Rocket was being reprinted. It has never been one of Knizia's better-known designs, and it's never been one of Knizia's better-loved designs, to be frank. If you go on Board Game Geek, the average rating is under 7 which is very low for uh, one, of his, uh, one of his games, especially when you compare the rest of the pedigree. So just to contextualize things, in 97, Knizia put out a game called Tigris and Euphrates. I think I'm pronouncing that right because I've never heard of the game. In 98, he put out a game called Samurai, and in 99, he put out Through the Desert. All of these are brilliant tile-laying games, and I don't use that word lightly, namely tile. Uh, and so it was the year after that, uh, or the same year he put out Through the Desert that he put out Stevenson's Rocket. And of those four games, three of them are critically adored, perennially in and out of print. Namely, there's always some other company ready to pick up, uh, uh, acquire the rights and g- give a new reprinting to, to a variety of these games. They're all on the shelves now. The exception is Stevenson's Rocket. It, it, it was out of print for a very long time, but despite that, it was one of those games that was heavily, heavily out of print, but it was not fetching triple-digit prices on the secondary market. You could track down used copies for much less money than that. Again, 
partially because it wasn't very highly desired. So when Grail Games announced that they were reprinting it, I was very happy because I'm a big fan of Stevenson's Rocket. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have put a spoiler tag in there. I really like Stevenson's Rocket. I'm in the minority on that one, uh, or at least I thought I was until now. But uh, they decided to reprint it. So it's back. Hooray. The answer to the question that no one asks. So why don't you tell us what we do in Stevenson's Rocket, Walker? In Stevenson's Rocket, you are trying to control the board and control the other players. And you do this by placing the stations on the board to force their movement and to block areas of the map. Because you can. there are specific rules of where you can place stations. They can't be beside other stations. They can't be beside trains. So by putting stations in strategic places you're really blocking large parts of the map and you're sort of manipulating people of where they want to move and stuff like that so and it's a lot about timing uh these trains are gonna are on a headlong you know collision for each other you can say and and trying to time it out so you they hit each other when it's your turn or just at the right spot is is a fantastic mechanism and to know there's this whole stock Uh, mechanism that we'll get into later I'm sure you need to know when to spend this stock and when to threaten to spend this stock because uh, when someone goes to move a train and you have more stock in this train than they do you can sort of you know lose some of the stock in order to force them to move it somewhere else or you can just you know put out a token bid and force them to lose some of their stock in this train in order to move it to where they want and that is the awesome game of Stevenson's Rocket so when people see Stevenson's Rocket, they often leap to the conclusion very reasonably that it is a pick-up-and-deliver game, when it is emphatically not. The thematic element of the trains crawling over the map doesn't make a whole lot of sense thematically. It just represents the gradual expansion of the rail lines encompassing more and more cities. Uh, it's closer to a choir, actually. The, the, uh, a friend of mine once described this game as a choir with trains, which... I think does uh, is is pretty close to the truth. Unlike a choir, though, the Sid Saxon classic, you don't have to worry about participating in the early mergers. One of the problems of a choir is if you can't manage cash flow, you're basically out. And another issue with a choir is that tiles enter the game randomly. In Stevenson's Rocket, this is a no-luck, perfect information euro, which you don't see a whole heck of a lot of in the context of stock games, but this is that is exactly what happens in Stevenson's Rocket. And Walker has identified a number of the different axes on which you start to play with people because the, the overall feeling that I, how I would characterize Stevenson's Rocket, and this is an overused phrase, but I think it's appropriate. It feels like an economic knife fight in a phone booth because everything is valuable, everything is precious, and everything is a weapon. In order to get anything done in Stevenson's Rocket, you always need about twice as many actions as you have and twice as many resources as you have. And that is even independently of the fact that you might be spending all these things just to frustrate the plans of your opponents. So there's tons of player interaction right from the start. So let's start talking about the stations, because that was the fir- one of the first things you identified. And I think that it's one of the things that uh, – it's one of the many axes on which the game hinges. So you talked about this issue of blocking off parts of the board. Want to elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I always want to talk about the fact that uh, much like other Knizia games, you only get two actions. So you have to make sure you know exactly what you're going to do during your turn. And like I said earlier, stations can't go beside other stations and they can't go beside railroads. And there's all of these uh, cities already on the map. And you also can't put a station where, the, where there's already track. So you're very limited to where the stations can go. So, and once you put one on, then you're even further limiting where uh, other stations can go. And when a station becomes part of a track by moving a train through it, you now have a bigger stake in that track because when a store when a scoring thing comes up, one of the scoring mechanisms is whoever has the most stations on that track. And this all feeds into the bidding system as well because when it's your turn to move, because you can't put the station right in front of the train, you have to put it a couple spaces away. So you can't always put a station down and move your train through it all in one turn. You sort of have to set it up. So people are going to try to move your the train away from your station. So this is where the, the stocks come in. So you can spend some of your stocks in order to force it through, or you can just say, well, I didn't expect it to go through that station anyway. I just wanted you to use up some of your stocks or block you from getting a station there. Or there's just so many. It's I, I, I compare it to Tigers and Euphrates, even though Mark doesn't see that comparison. Just the control and the manipulating of the other players and seeing how many uh, 
because of the way the railroads snake all over the board, seeing how one action can snake through the entire board and change the whole outlook of the board is very reminiscent of Tigers and Euphrates for me. I will grant that it is similar to Tigers and Euphrates in the sense that on a single turn, you can very rarely accomplish the true coup de grace or some earth-shattering uh, changing move. It sometimes happens in both of these games. But as you say, in Stevenson's Rocket, you spend one action to put out a station, and it can't be right in front of a train, and then you spend your next action to move the train a little bit closer to the station. So it's a two-turn enterprise at least to get a station onto a railroad. And railroad control in this game, in Stevenson's Rocket, is represented by two different factors. One of them is indeed this, this having stations on the line, and this is huge. Getting a single station onto an important railway line is a massive, massive advantage. It can be a tremendous difference in terms of the scoring, so the stakes are very high. But by the same token, the other way that you ha- exert control over the railway is in shares of stock. And frequently, in order to make sure that the railway gets to your station, you need to burn shares of stock in order to force people to move it to where you want it to go. Because no one's going to let you... Well, very rarely is it the case that someone's going to let you have it for free. And since at the end of the game you want both of these things, you need to have station majority or at least presence, and you need to have share majority or at least presence, maintaining both of these things can be brutally, brutally difficult. And this is one of the reasons why it's so incredibly confrontational. So why don't we go into a little bit more depth about this whole veto element, about how we use shares as a weapon. If I want to move a a railroad... Nobody can stop me from moving it. Once I spend an action to move a railroad, it's a done deal. And the first thing that happens is I get a share of stock in that railroad. But then anybody else that has any shares in that railroad, anybody who's previously spent actions moving it, can call a veto. And they can start bidding shares to force me to move it somewhere else. And at the end of the day, someone's going to be spending shares. They're going to be losing some of their control over that railroad in exchange for geographical control over where it went. And sometimes this is worth it, sometimes it's not. One of the purest elements of malicious joy that I've ever felt in a board game is setting up one of those veto auctions in Stevenson's Rocket and being able to craft, based on the board position and based on my share uh, share portfolio and everything else, being able to craft a bid so perfect that I know that no matter whether the other person calls me or not, they've already lost. That they cannot salvage their position because either I can spend the share and I don't care or because I'm in a position where no matter what happens, my station will be fine. And those are some of the moments of of just pure sadism that I adore in Stevenson's Rocket. So I'm going to try to link three parts of my notes here together. And that is when two tracks merge together. So this is uh, one of the bad points where uh, this game really is an advantage to people who have played before because this whole merging of the track thing is a little fiddly and counterintuitive. It's like the moving train is the one that's going to disappear and then there's this whole scoring mechanism afterwards as soon as they touch. So yes, so when you take an action to move a train and it even touches either one of the other trains or part of another line, then that that railway is no more. And this is part of the way the game ends. Once you were down to one uh, line, then the game is over. So the train touches, and then there's this whole scoring mechanism, and uh, the the tr- the line that's going to disappear pays out new shares to the new track at only half as much. One of those rules I think that new players might find a little fiddly and uh, not helpful. Visualizing the consequences and internalizing the consequences of a railroad merger, I agree with you are very counterintuitive and sometimes very daunting to new players. I think it is one of the things that truly makes the game, though, because in Stevenson's Rocket, that railway line that doesn't matter, it's not particularly lucrative, it's not really going anywhere, it's it's kind of dilled, fiddled itself into a position where it's probably not going to be very consequential. If it can run into a major railroad Suddenly, that person who is heavily invested in the useless railroad is now heavily invested in the best railroad, or vice versa. If there's a railroad that's dominating the game and you don't have any presence in it, you can run it in to that piddly little local railway uh, line that has never gone anywhere. And suddenly, 
that thing that was insignificant is now a monster and you have this built up advantage into it. And it's absolutely wonderful. It's like the mergers and acquire in that they have a lot of consequence, but since you're not actually spending money in Stevenson's rocket, it's just all about points. The only currency of the game is actions. Then you don't have to worry too much about, you know, being locked out of the early ones. Some of the later actions actually are more consequential than the early ones, but yes, visualizing it is tough. And this is where I think Allow me to, to, to give a little meat to my previous amazement at the game has been reprinted. I've had mixed luck in introducing Stevenson's Rocket to new players. Even players who really like Knizia games, tile lane games, cutthroat games, the scoring is relatively obtuse. There are three different kinds of scoring that happen during the game, another kind of scoring that happens at the end of the game, and then a combination of previously introduced scoring has happened at the end of the game as well. And you know, you can go over it over and over and over again, and the player aids in the new Grail edition I don't think are particularly good. I can barely understand what the iconography refers to, and I've internalized the game for a long time, so new players often don't find them any help whatsoever. The scoring is super obtuse. Explaining how the game works, how your actions work, takes five minutes absolute tops, probably closer to two or three. And then you explain all the different ways of scoring, and then people just start to zone out and over the course of the game they're like okay does this trigger this scoring no it triggers this other kinds of scoring it all works and it's all there for a reason but it's super hard to learn and i think that's one of the reasons why it never really found an audience uh the quite the same way that Knizia's other contemporary contemporaneous tiling games did yeah i think the other problem is that even when you uh explained it to me you said it's a railroad game with a stock market and it was like oh god here we go you know with an 18xx you know and the stock market is not really a stock market really it's more like you know like we said like bidding to change you know the direction and and a really cool resource that you can spend in the game we also haven't even talked about the trade goods yeah let's talk about that so they're they're called investments, investments. in the new version they were they were they were goods tiles they were goods tokens in the the previous edition what's your opinion on them i think it's uh it might be a different way to play. I think it's. I don't think it's enough scoring to worry about it. I agree 100%. It's strange for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's rare for a Knizia game to have ancillary scoring stuff that doesn't pay off quite the way you would think it should, right? Normally his scoring systems are so tight and so balanced that all the strategies seem viable and you never really think, oh, well, this is clearly the only thing, the only game in town. All this other stuff is cruft. When I play a Martin Wallace game, sometimes when I play a Stefan Feld game, I expect there to be these other bits that I can more or less ignore. I've played, you know, Byzantium, which is my favorite Wallace game, a bunch of times. Nobody takes the tax action. It just doesn't happen. It's just, you know, it, it, but it's so rare for a Knizia game. And the new Grail version exacerbates the problem because there's this massive spot on the board for the investments and it makes people think that it's a significant part of the game. So we haven't talked about investments previously. We were talking about the great thing about mergers and how stocks interact with the board position and, and stations and things like that. As one of your actions, you can just make an investment in one of the cities and it will pay out maybe a little bit over the course of the game and maybe a little bit at the end. Whereas the real meat of the game pays off much more. Well, if you do, like I said, I was thinking in my head quickly. If you do go heavy into it, you could get 18 points straight up by just having, you know, there's four columns. There's four columns. So that'd be 24 points alone if you go really heavy into it. You've won every column, every goods column, plus any other points that happen to pay out by investing in those cities and, you know, make a move to get some passengers, which is another six points on top of that. 30 points is nothing to sneeze at. And if you, you know, do one or two little moves to get in on a little bit of scoring, maybe so maybe it might be a big part. I don't know. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to claim that it's obviously weak or obviously imbalanced. It just seems a little bit off. No, but, and like I said, it seems like that to both of us, so... In, in the context of Stevenson's Rocket, though, 30 points is not a winning score, not even remotely. No. So you need to dominate all five kinds of goods, and it's hard to do that with the number of actions that you have and still be competitive in the railroad scoring because the way it, the way Stevenson's Rocket tends to work, as you say, at the end of the, the game ends when there is one railroad still issuing shares. And this railroad I tend to call the monster. It tends to link up 20, sometimes in excess of 20 locations. And that railroad is going to disgorge so many points at the end of the game that it will easily dwarf completely dominating the goods elements. In the, in the Pegasus 
version of the game, you had to sort out little tokens and put them all in the little industry cities. And that was a bit of a pain, but at least then it was just tokens on cities and you could grab one as an action. Here in the Grail version, it's like a third of the board is with the goods track and it's easier to eyeball who's got what. And it doesn't require setup at, uh, sorting at the beginning of the game. But I've generally found that when I explain the game to new players, upwards of 80% of the time, one of the easiest mistakes that new players can make is assuming that goods are more valuable than they are. And again, that kind of rough edge is unusual for a game, and it's a bit unfortunate. And I, the other one is the passenger, right? It's yet another odd scoring thing that just doesn't really get utilized. It's like we've played it several times and i think it was used once there was one time when i ought to have used it and didn't because i had already partially because i'd already internalized it was a bad call you get a passenger token uh which in 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 this in the grail edition of these lovely little wooden figures which again kind of makes it seem like they're more central to the game than they are which can get you six points at the end of the game but you only get that when you voluntarily link up an opponent's station onto a railroad line sometimes that's a good call sometimes it's a great call but Sometimes a single railroad station can be a 20-point swing if it's at the right time in the right place. So you really have to be confident that you can give your opponent this advantage and that it's worth it. And usually you're not in a position to do that. So that's one of the reasons why it comes up so seldom. The risk is so massive. Most of the game is about jockeying for these stations and docking, jockeying for these shares. And the game works perfectly on that basis with the occasional sprinkling of a little bit of investiture for a quick couple points here and there and that's okay uh but again new players tend to make the assumption that investment in these industries are going to be much more important it, it's a game of the industrial revolution for crying out loud i'm going to go invest in machine parts like that seems to make sense and it's a massive element of the game board in the grail version i can understand why they make the mistake and i hate 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 telling people how to play on a first play, even if it is a no luck, perfect information game where I have had the benefit of experience. I don't want to tell them, by the way, guys, goods aren't so hot. I wouldn't I wouldn't waste too much time on it. I, I don't want to do that. So it, it kind of makes me feel like I'm doing them a disservice when I, I, I see new player after new player going down the same cul-de-sac of inefficient point return. So uh, maybe this is just a personal problem that I'm externalizing, but I'm glad you feel the same way that I do about it, that it's a little bit off. All right, let's start to go through over some points now. Bad points. What have we got? In two of the games we played, it seemed to be this giant mash in the middle, which led to, like, massive fiddly bits. This train can't move because it will merge two tracks together, and it, it, and they all just, six tracks all merge in the middle, and it's game over, like, in one turn, in one round, right? So I thought that was kind of odd. And you already talked about the monster track. If players start focusing too much on one track this one track will become the monster for the whole game right and if one person gets ahead on that track then it's just going to be that way for the whole game you know what i mean they'll get a what a, what i wrote down here is a rolling win because they no one can catch up because they focus too much on that one track and they don't you know build their own tracks over here in order to merge onto that track because that's the main strategy is these this monster track is being built like it's merging into other ones one person is getting, be, becoming the leader because they have more stations on it. And then you work on your little slide track. You get a couple stations on, zi- on this track, and then you either you know ram it into the big track or force the main track to ram into this one, and suddenly you know, you've know you got two stations, what, which might now give you the majority on this main track, right? But if all the players just focus on this one track, then you know it's going to be the rolling win for the one player. I have to say, Walker, you are convincing me that there are significant parallels or more significant parallels than I'd imagined between Stevenson's Rocket and Tiger's New Radies. Because my answer to that issue, I agree with you that it is a possible issue, but I would merely point out that the same thing exists in Tiger's New Radies. Sometimes people get locked into thinking, this is my kingdom or this is my railroad, and they just make it bigger and bigger and bigger. The person who wins in, I think, both Tiger's New Radies and Stevenson's Rocket is the one who stays flexible, stays opportunistic, and sees how to kneecap the seeming juggernauts. And although it is the case that almost inevitably you're going to have a monster line, not not always, but most of the time, which line that is can change on a dime precisely because mergers are kind of what makes the game sing, which is a shame, which is what makes it a shame that mergers are sometimes the most difficult things to internalize. That issue, uh, the, the, the game you're talking about where a whole bunch of railroads were right next to each other, there was a brief moment of zugzwang because you're not allowed to move things in certain ways. It's kind of like how you're not allowed to join three kingdoms at once in Tigers and Euphrates. It happens slightly more often than Stevenson's Rocket, but I wouldn't say that it's a common problem. But again, it 
it's, as you say, these small deterministic actions that you take sometimes near the very beginning of the game that have these massive ripple effects. And if you can do well at the game, and by the way, I am not one of these people, by all rights, I've been playing this game for over 10 years, right? When I'm showing it to new players, I should be doubling their scores, like, because that's just the way it is with, with no luck, perfect information games. But I don't. I usually lose. And that, I think, is, I, you know, that, that, uh, that just shows how bad I am at this game. But I'm at least able to appreciate, in hindsight, some of the things that I ought to have been doing back in the day. And it is a joy to see people wrapping their heads around some of the ripple effects of these things, even when, and sometimes even especially when, they haven't quite fully internalized the scoring. On the point of scoring, I really, I actually have that under one of my good points. I think, I think that the scoring is very basic. I'm not understanding why people have problems with it. It's almost exactly like, let's just compare everything to Tiger Shin <laughs> It's almost like the external and internal, yes. you know, fights. It's like you have, if a station goes into a city, then the goods are going to pay off. If the... If the train goes by an industrial complex, then the line, the whole train line is going to pay off. And sometimes people are getting, you know, mixed up, you know, how the scoring works. I've never had this problem. Not to say that that doesn't matter. I'm just saying I really like how basic it is. You can see exactly what's going to happen. And I like the the point system. But it, it, it's basic, but it's hard to remember which... There are multiple different things that will trigger scoring. Each of them triggers scoring by a different criterion, and each criterion rewards a different aspect of the game. So, you know, basically over the course of the game, you'll score three different ways, and they're all a little bit different. A lot of people have difficulty latching onto them, very much like the the, the internal external conflicts. Okay, we've compared it enough to Tigers and Euphrates, yes. I think. Yeah. I'd like to compare it a little bit to uh, Through the Desert, because I think it's a little bit more similar to Through the Desert in that... It's more about blocking off space and claiming space in these very slow expansion of inexorable lines. Tigers and Euphrates, one of the geniuses of it is that the terrain is constantly shifting. Kingdoms disappear, tiles go away, leaders shift, etc., etc. And in Stevens' Rocket, you have to stay flexible, but there's just this slow, inexorable growth of lines. And what starts very small, and indeed not not existent at all, like your caravans and through the desert, they gradually get bigger and bigger. But what I like about Stevens' Rocket and why I prefer it over through the desert is because it has this added element of brinksmanship, and this added element of player interaction in the form of the auctions, the veto rounds, whereby you're you're using your stocks as a weapon. In Through the Desert, what you're just interested in is, is cutting people off spatially. But in Stevens' the Rocket, what you're interested in doing is collaborating on a railway line, but collaborating in the same way that, you know, saboteurs collaborate with the owners of a factory, namely using their own, uh, their, their own resources against them. And that element I just find completely delicious. And it's one of the reasons why I think basically uh, Stevenson's Rocket is, is Reiner Kinsey's second best tile laying game, which in the context of my taste is very high praise. Yep. So we've covered all my other points. It's a no luck. Unlike, uh, no, sorry, I'm not going to... Bring up Unlike the game that cannot be named anymore? Yeah, I'm not going to bring up Tiger Shin Freddy's anymore. Yeah. So we've covered all my points. The fact that there's no luck, only two actions, so the flow is very... It goes around the table very quickly. The actions are very simple. And we covered all the bad points, the mash in the middle, the rewards, veteran players. I'm wondering, Mark, what do you think is the best player count for Stevenson's Rocket? Four. It plays two to four. I have played it at all player counts. I have to say that two is... It works, but that's about as far as I'll go because, again, there's this issue of having shares in lots of different railways and being in competition with one person about the direction of one railway and another person. I think it's fine with three. I don't think it needs the max player count, but I don't think the two is, a spe- is an especially good player count for Stevenson's Rocket. Yeah, it's got the great feel of Imperial 2030 where, you know, don't, you know, invest too much in a particular country, right? That is not your army. That is not your country. You know, spread yourself out. And you don't know what country is going to be standing on top at the end of the game. And that's right. That, that's also another uh, salient comparison between Imperial and Stevenson's Rocket. So that, that's all my points. I am waiting to play it again. I'll play it at any time. Love me some Stevenson's Rocket. I don't know when and if it's going to enter general retail distribution because Grail Games has been having some financial difficulties in association with its fulfillment of Stevenson's Rocket. We wish them all the best. Uh, Grail Games also put out Yellow and Yangtze, so we're, we're a fan of their recent output. But Stevenson's Rocket, I think, 
in my collection, it's been a cornerstone for well over 10 years. I'm glad there's a new edition. I'm glad it's getting a new audience. And I'm glad it's getting the attention that I think it's deserved for all this time. And I, although I understand why it hasn't been as appreciated as some of Knizia's other designs or other comparable tile-laying games, I really do think it's in a class by itself. And the way these different elements come together is truly beautiful, even though in order to fully appreciate it, you do need to wrap your head around occasionally obtuse scoring. Just accept the fact that some people aren't going to be down for it, either because of that or because of how confrontational it is. But with those caveats in mind, I think it's fabulous. All right, now on to the topic of the day, which is dealing with frustration. I was very happy when Mark decided to bring up this because I thought I was the only person that had trouble with this dice bubble popping game. And I'm fine. I'm (laughs) very happy that we're finally going to take measures to destroy this thing that's slowly taking over the planet. All right, so let me let me let me talk about personal preferences here for just a second. Let me let me rant about something. The worst feeling in the world for me when I'm playing a game is when I can feel someone starting to get mad. When I can feel their frustration mounting and I can tell that there's something about the game either because they don't like it or because they're not doing well or because they think that, that the game is being unfair to them or they think the other players are being unfair to them. Right, wrong, or indifferent, right? This, this is independently of whether they have a point. It starts to mount and mount and mount. They start getting more and more frustrated. And here's why I find it so terrible. Two reasons. Number one, on a practical level, there's not much that can be done. Because one of the one of the only things that I've learned over the course of my uh, 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 years on this earth is number one that chocolate milk is delicious, and number two is that you can't tell anyone to calm down. That's untrue, Mark. I have this as my two best ways to stop things from getting. You say stop being frustrated. That's the best way. Or <laughs> you say, hey, it's just a game. Yeah. Those are the two best ways in order to calm a situation down. Yeah, you can't it, – it, it's, it's, it's a completely natural reaction to tell someone to calm down when they should calm down because sometimes people need to calm down. But there is nothing that will increase someone's frustration or make them more agitated than telling them to calm down. It's like telling someone to – well, it's like telling me to stop yelling. Nothing will make me yell louder than if you tell me to stop yelling. Often the thing that I will scream in someone's face is I'm not yelling, but you know, setting all that aside, setting my own personal problems aside. So that so on a practical level, I, I it, there's nothing to be done about it because the other thing, the other practical thing that I've tried sometimes saying, well, why don't we stop playing or why don't we go do something else? That tends to set a lot of people off as well because well, for a variety of reasons. Again, and I completely understand. I'm not saying that I don't do these things too. I'm just saying that on the receiving end of it, I don't really know much to do. The other thing that, I, that that makes it terrible for me is it's like it's an unwelcome gift. It's a game. It's supposed to be a fun social time. And when some when my conception of fun social time is reducing someone else to gibbering rage, well, that just kills my mood too. So, Yes, there's, like you said, there's definitely nothing that can be done at that particular time. Yes. But either before or after or in general, I think we have some ideas. Absolutely. And that's, right. yeah. So I'm going to just talk about the only two things that get me frustrated because nothing else gets me frustrated. That uh, Wow. <laughs> is one of them things and the other stuff? Cough. All right. So <laughs> the first thing is lost opportunities in games. Like when a company has uh, obtained an IP or... You know, the components are great or the whole theme is great and or a particular way some rules are interacting that's not utilized properly. That will totally set me off or uh, games that suffer due to lack of playtesting where it's obviously that the flow is not working, that if they had just let an unknown group play the game, that these problems obviously would have come up. That also you can see, you can hear the frustration in my voice build as I talk about it. So yes, just lack of playtesting. Those are the two main frustrating things. Can I tell you how I deal with issues like that? Sure. Again, because as you say, in the, in the middle of the moment, there's practically nothing that can be done. Usually it's only time is the, is the only cure. Uh, I have abandoned all expectations as a general rule. I expect everything to be to be terrible. I especially expect a themed game to be bad and not to be evocative of the theme. And as a result, whenever, especially a themed game is pleasant or whenever it's tightly designed, it's a welcome surprise. For And I even, I've, I've even been able to, to internalize this in the context of uh, games that really 
I, I have every reason to, to, to delight in. Like, for example, uh, if it's a Reiner Knizia auction game, I'm probably going to enjoy it or probably think it's good. But what I tell myself before trying someone out for the first game is, I know this will work, but it'll probably be super dry. And then if it's not, it's like, it's a delightful experience. Anyway, I'm not always good at doing this, but especially when it comes to, to theme games, I've noticed, I've noticed you get frustrated sometimes, especially when you're particularly attached to a property. I would just abandon all expectation. True. But you you build yourself up, right? Especially if it's like a Kickstarter or something you've heard of like way ahead of time and you're and you're anticipating this great moment and you say, Oh, this is gonna be a fabulous experience. I can't wait. Bum bum ba bum. <laughs> So one of the things that I wish we could do, and this is more of a uh, this is more of a pie in the sky. I wish we could do things in terms of uh, dealing with frustration. I wish that more board game contexts would accept what a lot of war gamers and sometimes even many miniatures gamers accept as elementary, and that is concessions. Calling a game early and recognizing it's like ah. Eh, we could play this out, but we're not going to discover anything that we don't already know or what have you. And if anyone is getting frustrated for whatever reason, could be because of a mistake they made in turn one, could be because the game is terrible, could be because whatever. I wish that there could be a general societal expectation and a general acceptance of the notion that, eh, let's put this away. M- might not be the game's fault, might not be any of the people's fault, but let's just just walk away from it. I understand why people aren't willing to do that, and I know that it's not going to happen, I just wish that we could have that that cultural expectation. Does that make sense to you? Totally does. Yeah. It sort of leads into what I'm going to say too. Is is in it, it's not in my the order that's on my list, but I think it's the one that is most uh, interesting to me, and it's perception. And it leads two way. Even if you think someone's being frustrated, maybe they're not. Maybe your that's perception a of a thing is. And if you are the one uh, that's frustrated, if it's because of a player or because of its rule and you think it's affecting the game or whatever, maybe it's not. Maybe your perception of what's going on is not exactly what is actually going on. So it's always best just to, you know, look back, you know, assess the situation, maybe talk about what's going on with the other players and maybe, you know, you've totally misjudged the whole situation. So the kind of mental switch that I try to to throw, and again, I'm not claiming I'm very good at this, when I feel myself getting frustrated, and I tend to mostly get frustrated when I feel that the game is being consistently unfair to me on a luck basis. And again, this is usually a false perception. The, the human mind is a wonderful thing. We recognize patterns where none exist. We're very bad at recognizing randomness. What is actually a random distribution will seem like a stacked deck. And like everybody else, I'm very, very good at remembering that time that I rolled snake eyes on that attack that was supposed to su- succeed, and I very easily forget that time that I did something stupid, but the dice saved me, right? But in those contexts where I can feel myself getting frustrated, what I try to do, again, I wish I could do it more successfully, is I try to, I, I try to switch what my priorities are. I transition from this is a game that I'm playing and I'm going to have fun and, and you know, parenthetically, but much less importantly, and I, I'm going to circle back to this issue later uh, and be competitive at, close brackets. And then it's like, okay, this isn't happening. This isn't working. I'm not having fun. I'm not enjoying it. Rather than be frustrated, I should said just rejigger my priorities, reshuffle what it is that I think that this encounter is about. It's no longer about me satisfying myself at a fun game. Now I have a moral responsibility not to be a douchebag to the rest of the people at the table who might be enjoying the game or whose enjoyment would be scuppered by my acting like a like a tiny sookie baby, right? And... It really is the case. We've talked about this a lot. A lot of our topics circle back to this issue. Well, for me anyway, but I I, I used to be a moral philosopher, so naturally. That you have a moral responsibility when you're entering into the social contract. And if I'm able to remind myself that, okay, fun fun isn't happening here, but you can still be a decent human being about it. Just accept that you're not going to have any fun, you, but you have, a, you have a moral duty to carry forth your, your social expectations. I have sometimes had success with that in terms of curbing my own frustration. Yeah, no, I totally have that as my last remark here. Just remember you're not the only one at the table. Even if you're having a terrible time, then these other people at the table have a very limited time that they can set aside for board games. This is their one time that they have to have fun. And you and you and like you said, you have a moral obligation to try to make that time fun for them. That's what you've agreed to when you sat down at this table and played this game. I do want to get back to randomness because when you were talking about it, uh, another idea popped in my head. You know, it doesn't happen very often. But in these games, randomness comes in two ways. Maybe they should have more of nothing happens when you do a random thing because when when it's something good, 
people often tend to think that that's the norm. It's like when when you pull something random, everyone gets something good. That's what that's what should happen. And when something bad happens, then it's really bad because it's not something good. So I'm just wondering that you know you know enti- the sense of entitlement some people have when they're drawing something random that it's going to be good when I, they flip it up. I wouldn't say entitlement. I would say this is more about loss aversion. We've talked we've talked about the feeling of this in other games, right? The opportunity cost of one person getting 10 bucks and someone else getting nothing is the same as somebody getting nothing and someone else losing $10. But the sensation of being $10 behind someone changes radically whether you're paying money out of pocket or just watching someone else get money, just just to pick an arbitrary example. And I agree with you that this this feeds into what kind of games you should pick, especially if you know and if you start trying to pay attention to the kinds of ways that people get frustrated. Because this is... Sometimes I've been able to do this. Sometimes if I play regularly with gamers that tend to find certain experiences very frustrating, I'm able to make a mental note. It's like, ah, they find this kind of interaction to be very, very frustrating and unpleasant. I just shouldn't play games like that with them. Or even for me, it's like this is you know just an extension of your own taste. It's like not only do I not like games with this element, just more they, they kind of make me so frustrated that I become an unpleasant person to be around. So a lot of people get frustrated by take that elements. A lot of people get frustrated by direct auctions that are particularly mean. A lot of people get frustrated by dice-based combat where bad things can happen. You know, there, there's a whole bunch of different things that really push people's buttons. And if you want to be a good board game evangelist, if you want to be a good host, if you want to be a good friend, the next time you see a fellow player really start to get frustrated about something, try to figure out, okay, what is it about this environment? Is it just a, is it just a fluke? Or is this a me- mechanical element that reliably gets them upset that I should just avoid in future playings, if at all possible? And I've had a little bit of success with that, to be frank. The other thing I would uh, make note of is uh, making sure the rules are very clear. Nothing is more upsetting to people that if you pull a rule out at the end of the game, say, oh, no, you actually do get to score all these cards at the end of the game, or no, you don't get to do that at the end, or oh, didn't I tell you we're going to score all of this again for the third time? I know for some people explaining the rules is hard, and sometimes you just want to, you know, get the game on the table and get going and, you know, read from the rule book as you go, but... For some people, it can't be more frustrating when rules come out of the woodwork and changes either like A, their whole strategy or, you know, someone's going to get a whole bunch of points that they didn't count on or or going, to, or going to lose out on a bunch of points because of the way one word has changed, you know, that they thought they're going to get this big crestfall at the end because they thought all of this type of card was going to score. But it's like, no, it's not that little icon. It's this other icon. And it's just like, oh, you know, just so try your best to keep the rules very clear. Absolutely. The biggest cardinal rule for me, and again, this is a sort of cultural change that I don't know how to introduce, but I wish would happen, is everyone generally being less competitive because it takes the stakes out of the situation. And sometimes, you know, it's it. there are obvious ways and there are less obvious ways. One of the things that we talked about very early on in the podcast, I, which I think we started like, I don't know, 20 years ago or something like that. It feels that long. Yeah, because that's when we invented podcasts, uh, was... Whenever there's any luck element in games, and almost all the games have some element of luck, even in a game like Stevenson's Rocket, you could talk about some things breaking well for you in the sense of some other player's actions benefiting you more than it did. After you've won a game, don't start talking about all the awesome crap you've done. Because I really do think that that leads to a culture of internalizing stakes and of frustrating people. When you've lost... Also, don't start trying to think about all the ways in which in which terrible things have happened to you. I like a culture, and I like post-game discussion, where, number one, you actually, you know, try to look at the game state in a, in a slightly more objective way. But that's just my more analytic side that, that I like to do. But mostly, I like it when the uh, the winner gets to emphasize how they were just lucky and how the losers were unlucky. And you all get to tell this fiction about how, well, we all just had a pleasant experience, and the winner doesn't really matter at all. And a lot of people don't like talking about things that way, but I really do appreciate it when somebody wins a game and is willing to uh, willing to engage in not necessarily a lie, but a pleasant little social lubricant of emphasizing the times in the game where they felt that they were fortunate rather than clever. Because I really do think that if, if you if if you once you take out really identifying with wins and losses, I do think that that helps with some areas of frustration, although not all. Unless the other person was, you know angry about the randomness in the game and you say look I just randomly got this thing and that's what allowed me to win well no you get <laughs> and then they go I know no 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 it's more 
I know, I know what you're trying to say. Sympathizing. Yes, in that I, case, yeah. it, it, it's sympathizing. It's like, look, yeah, or, or you're even just, yeah, I don't know what I would have done in that situation too. So, exactly. Because, again, sometimes when I've been overly frustrated, I feel really bad about it afterwards. And sometimes just someone saying, yeah, I saw what happened there. I saw what the cards did to you. I saw what the dice did to you. I saw what the, the, the game state did to you. I don't know what I would have done there either. I was really lucky to be in this other situation. Sometimes that opens the door for someone to say the necessary thing and say, yeah, sorry, I got so frustrated. And then everyone can say, no, 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 it's fine. It's like, look, it happens. Uh, you were in a tough spot. I was in a good spot. You know, whatever. And I, I, again, acknowledging those things is one of the ways that I think you can you can be better in the future and try to acknowledge that it is a bit of a downer, but by the same token, someone's going to hold it against you for the rest of your life. Agreed. So thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can reach Walker via his email, justrolledadice at gmail.com. That's J-U-S-T-R-O-L-L-D-A-D-I-C-E at gmail.com. You can reach me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at the games you like. For more public discussion, you can find the So Very Wrong About Games Facebook page, or you can check out our Board Game Geek Guild, which is guild number 3236. We read everything you send us, and we will get back to you if we possibly can. Thanks again very much for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care. If you like this podcast, tell your friend. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigman. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>